You think how many years a students are learning maths and sometimes how little they go away with. Now, why is that? There's no evidence that knowing your times table helps you understand arithmetic. You know, I really wasn't very good at my multiplication tables when I was at primary school. And it was learning that there were different bits of mathematics that, I, that resonated with me that, that, that turned the subject on for me. How do we go about turning all students on to mathematics? The deep learning method can help. It comes at a time when human society is getting more complex. Automation, powered by artificial intelligence, means that many task-oriented and information processing skills will be needed less. The jobs of the future will require higher educational requirements and deeper learning competencies. Are we teaching deeply enough? Deep learning is really a broader perspective of everything that we do in a classroom. Deep learning is a uh, process that the brain goes through in order to look at the data that we see at the moment and pick out what's important for it to, to learn something new. I'd have thought it is being able to understand a mathematical concept from different perspectives, in different representations, in different languages, and also as applied to different contexts. Deep learning acknowledges the very clear differences between deep and surface learning. It starts with Jean Piaget's developmental emphasis on student engagement. The idea is to get students actively processing information, not passively receiving it. It gets them questioning information, not uncritically scanning it. It gets them using and testing ideas, not just memorizing them. And it encourages thinking broadly, not narrowly. The learning is motivated by ideas, not just by tests. And ideas get taken beyond the classroom, not left behind. A child I know who is uh, learning deeply in mathematics often quite uh, learns deeply in other subjects as well, because they're able to think about things further than, you know, beyond what they're being taught and what has to be done right there. It all begins with interactive whole class teaching. This method gets students working together on the same lesson content at the same time. The teacher and students become a team in a very organic way, and this team makes sure that no student gets left behind. So how do you get started with interactive whole class teaching? If there are teachers who are a bit nervous about creating environment for deep learning, I would say, for mathematics at least, problem-based learning. The use of anchor tasks often will bring about deep learning. And that's because anchor tasks have been shown to activate prior learning. They trigger collaboration and they really jumpstart questioning. I think one thing we've learned is to let them struggle. To actually step back, give them the anchor task, give them the focus task, give them the problem and step back and not give them any help at all. We might go around and take some pictures of what they're doing um, and share that later. But to actually let them struggle um, and that's where their learning comes. Perseverance is part of a supportive group dynamic here where it's hard to forget what you learn when you're this socially engaged. When they do encounter a problem, it's not, let's put my hand up and ask the teacher, Is can I ask the friend next to me? Can I ask the one behind me? Maybe they know better. The teacher's life is much, um, is nicer really in that they've got students who are interested in what they're doing and not just doing it to pass the test. Teachers do instruction and assessment at the same time. They move around the classroom, they offer guidance and feedback as they go, and they find out and document which students comprehend quickly and which require assistance. Can you show me another way? Is this the only way of doing it? Or can you defend your answer and can you convince me that the way you're doing it is the right way? I think teachers that take risks when they're teaching um, are likely to produce children that take risks when they're learning, which is what we all want, which is brilliant. But you have to, you have, to have an SLT, uh, a management structure in school, that allows that to happen. So if um, your SLT and your management are risk takers or they believe in you as a teacher, you're more likely to take risks as a teacher and therefore you're more likely to produce children that take risks as learners. You can't have a growth mindset from your children unless you're prepared to have that growth mindset yourself. So you've got to be open to it. And I think it's about seeking advice, looking where mastery already exists, going to visit that, uh, be, being open and then digesting that and working out what that will mean for your school and what that process will look like as well. 
Collaboration is key to deep learning because humans have a natural social instinct to reach out to others when they have a task that needs doing. Deep learning fosters independence in people, but I think at the same time there needs to be that collaboration in order to create that deep learning, whether it be obviously collaboration between the students and teachers or the students together. The influential psychologist Lev Vygotsky insisted that learning originates in social interactions. Individual learning is seen as a means to the success of group learning. Several high watermarks in Western civilization bear this theory out. The Internet was created by scientists eager to collaborate as if they were sitting in the same room. This aspect of deep learning was based on an early groundbreaking psychological study. When test subjects were shown an animation of geometric shapes, they attributed human characteristics and motivations to the shapes they saw. Humans, it seems, view the world socially. We work and learn very well together in groups. Um, we always say that a quiet classroom is a suspicious classroom um, and expect that the majority of the lesson to be um, talking. I think when you're solving complex problems and you're thinking about different solutions, the only way we solve it as adults is through collaboration. So obviously it would be a natural um, way to create your own class in terms of collaboration and getting children to collaborate. It's about getting them to talk to each other and think not just about what they're doing and what their understanding is, but to think about what another person's understanding is and try and share and come to some kind of collaborative understanding. And almost stepping back from being teachers and allowing the children to learn at that depth themselves, to know what they want to explore and how to explore it, and to not be so precise with the instructions or maybe just do this and it will work. It's allowing the children to explore a little bit more and, and discover that depth themselves. It's important to leave room for what mathematician Zoltan Deans called the dynamic principle, where exploratory play can help lead to deeper conceptual understanding. Some students will actively start to teach others in spontaneous acts of collaborative pedagogy. These mini-teachers gain confidence while ensuring others make it to the next level too. Mini-teachers is something that we use in the classroom because sometimes children will say, yes, I've got it, I know it but having to explain that to somebody else and show somebody else, especially someone who might be struggling a little bit, it makes them dig deeper in their own understanding to be able to break it down and, and explain it more clearly. And sometimes children ex understand better from a child explaining it than they do from an adult explaining it. And I think that's how you consolidate that learning and I think you don't really show true depth of something or true mastery of something until you're able to explain it to somebody else. And that, that's just the real essence of teaching, isn't it? In terms of actually how do you internalize your learning? You have to go over it, you have to be able to explain it to other people. And then when you're explaining it to other people, quite frequently you make new connections uh, in, within yourself, which then add to the mastery. This degree of mastery involves what math educator Richard Skemp calls relational understanding. And that's full knowledge of why rules and procedures work, not simply that they do. Diversity of opinion and approach is key to deep learning and important to mathematician Celia Hoyles. She says we need to listen to our students to understand their unique perspectives, not disregard them. What is not deep learning is if you only recognise it and appreciate and understand its structure in one particular circumstance. Children and teachers will go off on different tangents because they'll have different um, exper life experiences and they'll have different interests as well. That means that because of their curiosity about something where one might decide to think, oh, how does this link to shape? Someone else might think, how does this link to shopping? Deep learning rejects a number of harmful myths, like the idea that some people just can't do maths or that mathematical ability is primarily inherited. All children can learn mathematics. So getting away from this idea of top middles and lowers, so having them all together and then developing really sound subject knowledge and questioning. Getting away from the labels, yeah. you don't have um, greater depth children. Children no. don't get, get to a greater depth level. Um, you get children that think more deeply. Um, and get, So getting rid of those labels and getting rid of the idea that maths is all about speed and it's all about lots of quick right answers and it's actually about the discussion and the understanding and the deeper thinking that goes around it. You have to reduce the stress of doing calculation against the clock. So this is, makes it different from other, other aspects of learning. You don't have to read against the clock. You don't have to do history against the clock. So I think you, you could reduce anxiety by doing that.
The values embedded in the deep learning method make it ideal for teaching disadvantaged students. The children that we teach come from disadvantaged backgrounds and therefore they need the absolute best start to get on in the world. And our vision is that the way we've taught them will enable them to get through secondary school and on to further education just by their autonomy. People with dyscalculia are not very well, um, don't get very good jobs. Sometimes they're not employed at all. They also tend to have more trouble with, uh, with health, with the law, and of course you need to spend extra money trying to train them up. The lack of deep learning will definitely prevent students from having subsequent opportunities at learning mathematics to the highest level and that would limit their choice in their subsequent learning and eventually in their choice of career. I'm sure if you ask mathematicians what they think maths learning is about, it's not really about all the procedures, they have to know that. It's about looking at symmetries and patterns and beauty and enjoyment. We ought to have a bit of that actually in maths. I think very often the way we teach mathematics is great for the geeks and nerds, but sometimes you need other stories to bring in people who perhaps don't find mathematics immediately accessible. You know, there are different ways to think about mathematics. It's not just through number, it's through geometry, it's through pattern, it's about different ways of thinking. That's what mathematics is for, it's for telling these stories that, uh, and these discoveries that we've made over the centuries. Um, just limiting students to uh, learning about the, the, the grammar and the language, of course they're going to give up and say, why do I need to know this? We need to tell them the stories you can tell with this language. And I think connections is the key word here. So you want to have stories that connect to, to nature. Kids love nature. If they see that nature has a lot of mathematics in, uh, honeycombs are hexagons, why is that? Cicadas that use prime numbers, how are they doing that? So I think uh, using nature, using music, um, using a bit of theatre, uh, play, playing some of these stories out, I think there are many stories that we can introduce at a really quite an early stage which will help just um, open people's minds to what maths could be.